Hello, everyone. Welcome to our second proteomics webinar uh, on analyzing UK Biobank proteomics data on the UK Biobank Research Analysis Platform. Uh, if you attended our uh, recent showcase webinar, this one will be diving even more deeper into how to actually analyze the data on the platform specifically. Um, we just got a question, uh, and this is perfect. I was just about to segue into it. This webinar is being recorded and will be shared about uh, 24 hours after the webinar is finished, um, and slides will also be available on the DNA Nexus community forum. I also wanted to, we're trying something a little new this webinar as well. At the end of the session, about at the top of the hour, we'll be hosting a drop-in session style Q&A for RAP users to ask general questions about working with the platform, working with the new data, anything that they have uh, questions about working with UK Biobank RAP, you're welcome to ask. That'll be at the end of the traditional uh, proteomics presentation, and we'll be making an announcement when that happens. If you have to go and come back, that's totally fine. We'll be starting that at the top of the hour. And if you have a question during the webinar, you can ask it in the Q&A box. That is in your uh, tools at the bottom of the screen. It is the one uh, with question mark box uh, that should be on your bottom left and might already be popped up for you. And before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items. If uh, you are a UK Biobank researcher, prospective UK Biobank researcher looking to collaborate with other researchers or view helpful resources for working with the data or working on the research analysis platform, join the DNA Nexus community. Um, your people are able to connect with other UK Biobank researchers, post tools and tutorials, and you'll also see announcement for webinars and trainings like this one. Uh, that'll be in the related content section, um, or you can scan that QR code to sign up. Uh, the related content section is the little paperclip at the bottom of your screen. I just highlighted it. I'll be mentioning it a few more times. If you are an early career researcher or a researcher from a low or low middle income country, you can get funds to work directly on the research analysis platform courtesy of AWS and UK Biobank. And uh, these funds are broken down into either just getting started on a project or enhancements for a project that's already currently be, being started. And if you qualify for this, you're also qualified for reduced access fees to the tier three data. That's the big data. Um, for genomics data for you to get access to everything. So again, that is in the related content section. If you'd like to apply, you can also scan that QR code for more information. And if you're a commercial org looking for assistance in starting to analyze the new proteomics data on UK Biobank RAP, the DNA Nexus team is here to help. We can help you cut the time from analysis to results and get the results you need to more effectively and much quicker. We help UK Biobank researchers navigate the rich data set, understand insights that researchers can derive from the new data types like the proteomics data that you'll be hearing more about today, develop tools and get the most out of UK Biobank RAP. We have flexible package options available and you can request more information by scanning the QR code or again, clicking the link in the related content section. I'm gonna highlight that one more time and you'll be hearing about it again, but uh, let us help you be first to publish, first to market, scan the QR code now. And if you are already working on the UK Biobank RAP and you have research that you would like to promote in an upcoming event and a webinar or be part of a researcher roundtable to talk about your work, um, we've also now have the newsletter Spotlight, which is hosted on the DNA Nexus blog and in our monthly newsletter where we interview a researcher, a RAP researcher currently working about what they're working on um, and other tools and tutorials they've developed or organize a meetup and workshop, you can request that through our application. There's the bit.ly link and the QR code that you can scan. Also again, related content section. And finally, if you are a UK Biobank approved researcher and you are not already on the research analysis platform, it is actually a part of your approved application. So you can join now for free and sign up and receive 40 pound credit for working directly on the platform just for joining. It takes only a few minutes and it connects to your AMS account. And again, this is part of your approved application already. So there's no extra fees for being able to register an account. So that is uh, the sign up through that bit.ly again as well. Also in the related content section, I'll highlight that one more time or scan the QR code now. All right, so that is it for all my housekeeping items. I'm gonna pass it over to Alexander Lee who will be kicking off the presentation and taking you through working with the proteomics data on RAP. 
Hi, everyone. So uh, yeah, welcome to uh, today's webinar, where we'll be walking you through how you can analyze the new proteomics data on the UKB RAP. My name is Alexandra Lee, and I'm a senior community engagement and biomedical data scientist here at DNA Nexus. Uh, here is just a brief outline for today's webinar. So first, I'll introduce the new proteomics data that's now available on the UKB RAP. Uh, next, we will uh, show you how you can access this new data on the platform. And then finally, we'll walk you through a couple of example use cases for how, how you can get started analyzing the new data on the platform. So just a note that today's webinar is a uh, follow-up from the previous integrative analysis of UK Biobank proteomics data webinar that was housed in April. Um, so in this previous webinar, they performed a really comprehensive overview, um, talking about the new proteomics data that's now available, um, talking about the uh, consortium project that generated this data, as well as the technology that was used to measure it, um, and also mentioning some of the technical sources of variability, as well as the QC measures that were taken. Uh, they also uh, nicely highlighted some of the really exciting integrative analysis ideas that the research community can start thinking about now with this new data type available on the platform. And so uh, overall, this uh, previous proteomics webinar provides a really uh, nice context for today's webinar, where we're going to dive more into the uh, technical details for how you can analyze this new proteomics data. So if you haven't uh, seen this previous webinar, I really encourage you to watch it, and the link is here. So some additional uh, other webinars that might be uh, helpful resources in the context of today's webinar uh, include the following. So the first is this overview webinar, just walking through the basics of the platform. Uh, the second is a webinar um, showing you how you can use the Jupyter Lab notebooks on the platform, which is something that we'll use in our examples today. And then the last is this end-to-end -end target discovery workflow webinar where uh, it talks um, it's walking you through how you can perform an association test on the platform, which is, again, something that we will show you in our analysis today. So before we get started, um, I just want to briefly review the learning objectives for today. So by the end of the webinar, we hope you'll be able to articulate the proteomics data that's now available on the platform. We hope you'll be able to apply the steps that we outlined today in order to extract and access the proteomics data, as well as to um, apply apply the steps to uh, download and access the analysis code on the platform. We also hope you'll be able to execute a couple of complementary proteomic analysis um, workflows uh, using the tools on the platform. And finally, we hope to introduce you to the UKB RAP community forum, which is a really valuable resource for um, helping you use to, uh, all along your journey to using uh, the UKB RAP. So uh, let's get started by first talking uh, a bit about the new proteomics data that's available on the platform. So in general, uh, proteomics gives a snapshot of an organism state where the proteomics or protein expression profiles tells you what proteins are active or expressed and how much they are. And so by studying these proteomic or protein expression profiles, we can uh, identify biological processes and mechanisms that are contributing to some stimuli or trait of interest. And so the proteomics data that's uh, available on the platform was generated by the UKB Pharma Proteomics Project or the UKB PPP. This was a collaboration between the UK Biobank as well as these 13 pharmaceutical companies where they sought to characterize the plasmic uh, proteomic profile for about 53,000 participants um, using Oling technology. And so in this first uh, tranche of data that's now available, uh, this contains um, proteomic profiles for about 53,000 participants, measuring about uh, 1,500 proteins. And so just a little bit about the Oling technology. So this Oling technology is a multiplex affinity-based proteomics platform that's using a library of pre-selected uh, antibodies to target proteins in solution, where there's about two proteins sorry, two antibodies per protein. And so when the antibodies um, recognize and bind to their target protein, this allows for their DNA oligonucleotides to then hybridize and form a template um, for PCR amplification and sequencing. And so for more information about this Oling technology, you can see their white paper here. And uh, after the raw data comes off the sequencer and has been pre-processed a bit, this is kind of what the data will look like. 
So you'll have samples along the rows and you'll have proteins along the columns. And in this case, uh, in the first tranche of data, the proteins represent uh, four uh, different panels, including inflammation, oncology, cardiometabolic, and neurology. And then the values within the cells here are these normalized protein expression or NPX values that represent relative protein abundances that have been log to transformed and also background corrected. And so for more information about how the raw data was uh, pre-processed, you can see the supplementary, supplementary material um, that's a part of the UKB uh, PPP preprint that talks about the new proteomics data that was generated. So that's a little bit about the new proteomics data. Now let's talk about how we can access this data on the platform. So just a note that uh, in order to access this data, your UKB application will need to uh, at least have tier two access. So your UKB application will need to be at least tier two or above in order to access this new data. And this is something that you can uh, verify by logging into your AMS account. And so uh, once this is uh, verified, there are a couple of ways that you can add the new proteomics data to your project. So the first is that you can just refresh the data on an existing project. And the second is that you can create a new project and dispense the data to that project. And this is something we recommend you do, especially if the refresh is taking a while. So there are a couple of couple pieces of data that we'll collect for our examples today. So the first is this phenotype data set, and the second is our proteomic or protein expression data set, both of which you can access via the cohort browser. So let's first talk about how we can uh, access the phenotype data set from our cohort browser, where here we will filter our set of 500,000 uh, participants based off of a field or a combination of fields of interest. And so here, just as an example, we're showing uh, filtering based off of smoking status, where once we perform this filtering, the resulting uh, cohort or phenotype data set uh, contains participants who have ever smoked before, where we have about 300,000 participants out of our 500,000. And so then we can access this cohort or phenotype data set using this uh, identifier uh, that has the form project ID colon record ID. And so for uh, some more concrete examples for how you can create uh, similar phenotype data sets, uh, you can see a couple examples in the links here. Okay, so uh, moving on to the second piece of data that we need to collect. Uh, so now we want to get the uh, proteomic or protein expression data that is associated with our phenotype data set that we just created. And there are two ways that we can uh, collect this data. So the first is to use uh, the GUI using this table exporter app. And the second is to use the command line interface using this DX extract data set command. And we'll show you both of these today. So let's first talk about how you can extract the data using this table exporter app. So this table exporter app is a tool that can be found within the tool library of your UKB wrap. And so here is just a screenshot of the execution page where there are uh, three different inputs that we'll need to provide for this. So the first is we'll need to provide the phenotype or cohort data set that we just generated. And this is going to be a dot data set file that's in your wrap project. The second is a file containing the list of fields that we want to extract. And so in this case, this will be our participant ID, so our EID, as well as our 1500 protein names. So for example, AARSD1 here. Um, and so just for reference, we've actually already created a file that contains all 1500 proteins and we've made it available uh, in this link here. And then finally, you'll also need to provide the entity table from which to extract these field names from. Uh, and the entity table for the proteomics data will take the form of olink underscore instance underscore number here, um, where in this case, we're using this olink instance zero here, but there's actually a couple of different options for this, and we'll discuss this in a few slides. So this is how you would access um, the data using the GUI, using the table exporter app, um, but there's also a programmatic way to do this using <coughs> this DX extract data set command that's seen here. And so again, there's a couple of different inputs that we'll need to provide for this. So the first is we'll need to specify the phenotype data set identifier or cohort data set identifier. We remember this comes in the form of project ID colon record ID. 
And then next, we'll need to provide a list of the field names to extract, where here, our list of field names will uh, need to have the format of NTT table dot field name here. And so let's just talk a little bit about how you can generate this list of field names programmatically. So in order to generate this list of field names, we'll first need to extract the uh, dictionary files that are associated with our cohort or phenotype data set. And the way we can do that is to run the following command. And this will generate these three different dictionary files here. But the one that we're specifically interested in is this uh, data dictionary file that contains our entity table names, as well as our field names here. And so uh, with that data dictionary file, we can then query this uh, to get the field names that are associated with our Olink instance zero entity table here. And as you can see, these include our participant ID and then our different protein names here. Then once we have our list of field names, we then need to format um, those field names to take the form entity table dot field name. And so our resulting list will look like the following where we have Olink instance zero dot EID comma Olink instance zero dot AARSD one uh, and so on and so forth. And so that's um, our list of field names here. The very last piece of input that we'll need to provide is just a file name for which we can output our results to. And so for the full uh, script that actually walks through how you can extract the new proteomics data from the, uh, from the cohort browser, uh, you can follow, uh, follow the link here to see the Jupyter Lab Notebook. And so the resulting uh, proteomic or protein expression data that we'll get um, from performing this extraction looks like the following. So hopefully this looks familiar where we have our samples along the rows here and then our proteins along the columns. And then we have our normalized NPX values uh, within the cells. And just a note that not all proteins were measured per sample. And so if this is the case, uh, you'll actually have some empty cells here. And so within the UKB wrap, you actually have access to three proteomic uh, or protein expression data sets. And these data sets differ um, by the samples that are available. And so uh, for the first uh, data set, which is the one that we anticipate most users to use, this uh, data set contains about 53,000 samples that were randomly selected from our half a million UKB participants that were uh, age, sex, and uh, recruitment center stratified. And so to access this data set, you'll use the entity table Olink instance zero here that we showed. And then for the other two data sets, these each contain about a thousand samples each, where these a thousand samples come from participants that are enrolled in the COVID-19 imaging study for which there are two repeat visits. So for the second uh, data set here, these correspond to the first visit. And then for the third data set here, this corresponds to data from the second visit. And then in addition to this imaging study, um, these samples also include a, selected, a, a set of pre-selected samples that were pre-selected by the 13 pharmaceutical companies based off of traits of interest. And so to uh, use the second data set, you'll use the Olink instance uh, two entity table. And for the third data set, you'll use the Olink instance three entity table. And so in general, if you're interested in the most UKB representative data set, we suggest using this first data set here. But of course, you're welcome to combine all the data uh, together, um, but just be wary of, um, of possible um, bias in the structure, just given how uh, the samples were selected. So in addition to the proteomic data that is now available in the cohort browser, there's also uh, associated metadata that can be found in the bulk directory of your project using uh, this path here. And there are, um, multiple different files that are available. Uh, just to shout out a couple of them, um, some of the files include uh, the limit of detection for each of the proteins, as well as a PDF documenting the QC steps that were performed. And so while there, while the proteomics data that's available on the platform has already gone through some pre-processing and QC, you're of course welcome to perform uh, your own custom as well as additional uh, pre-processing steps. And so um, hopefully these uh, files would be useful for that. Okay, so that's a little bit about the how you can access the proteomics data on the platform. Let's move on to how you can now access the analysis code uh, on the platform. 
So all of the analysis code to run the uh, use case examples that we'll show today is available in the public UKB RAP repository on GitHub uh, following this link here. Uh, to act to um, get access to these analysis scripts on your UKB RAP platform, you'll need to perform the following steps. So first, you'll need to clone the repository to your local machine. Then you'll navigate to that uh, cloned repository. And then finally, you'll use the DX toolkit command in order to upload the analysis scripts to um, the destination that you want on your um, UKB RAP project. And that's it. So at this point, we have our proteomics data available on the platform, and we have our analysis code available on the platform. Uh, we're now ready to start uh, performing our example use cases. And the first uh, example that we'll show you today is to how you can perform a differential expression analysis. So in general, differential expression analysis is used to compare the proteomic ex expression profile between two groups of samples. So here we're just showing an example of a set of healthy patients versus a set of sick patients, where the uh, proteins that are found to be differentially expressed can help to identify possible mechanisms of uh, action here. So uh, for example, comparing the uh, protein expression profile for our healthy versus sick patients, we noticed that our protein B is differentially expressed in our sick patients. And so perhaps this, this can point to some biological process that our protein B is a part of that can um, point to some uh, possible point of intervention here. And so here is the analysis approach and workflow that we'll use to perform our differential expression analysis, where we'll start with our protein expression data and our associated phenotype data. This will then go through a set of QC steps in order to remove any technical sources of variability that might disrupt our biological signal that we're hoping to detect. And then once we have our post-QC data, we can then perform our differential expression analysis using a well-established uh, package lemma here. Uh, and then using, based off of our um, differential, differentially expressed statistics, we can uh, determine which proteins are significantly differentially expressed. And so uh, to start, let's talk about uh, the input data that we'll use. So just a note here that we are not using UKB data. Instead, we are using public proteomics data for demonstration purposes. So the public proteomic data that we'll be using comes from this Kivisak et al. study, where they were trying to identify uh, protein biomarkers for cognitive decline. So here we have our public uh, protein expression data with our samples along the rows and our proteins along the columns here. And then we have our associated phenotype data, which uh, for each sample we have a cognitive outcome phenotype where we have some patients that are stable and then other patients that uh, cognitively declined and went on to develop Alzheimer's. And so typically we'll perform some QC in order to remove missing and outlier data, as well as to normalize the data to reduce any sort of bias. And so for this public proteomic data, um, the data has the data provided was actually already uh, post-QC'd. And so here is our post-QC'd um, protein and associated phenotype data that we'll use. We can then input this into Lima to perform our differential expression analysis, where essentially what Lima will do is it will compare the distribution of a given protein in our stable group and compare that to the same, um, the distribution of that same protein in our declined group and perform a moderated t-test to determine if there is a significant difference between the distributions. And so after we run um, our data through Lima, we find that there are 44 differentially expressed proteins uh, that were identified, which um, cover processes including inflammation, extracellular matrix, neurodegeneration, and vascular processes, all of which were um, also found in the paper. So this entire analysis workflow to perform this differential expression analysis was performed using uh, Jupyter Lab notebooks on the platform. So this is just to briefly review how you can access the Jupyter Lab, um, Jupyter Lab on the platform. So under the tool library, you'll click Jupyter Lab Notebooks, and then you will um, specify the configuration you want for the Jupyter Lab instance. 
And for more uh, detailed information about how to run Jupyter Lab on the UKB wrap, we encourage you to watch uh, the webinar linked here. And so once you um, spin up your Jupyter Lab instance, you can then navigate to the location on your um, project where you've um, uploaded your analysis scripts to. So this is from our cloned repository that we mentioned previously. And then what you can do is just run the notebooks uh, in order here. And so here is just a summary of the resources for being able to rerun this analysis where the code to kind of explore the input data. So just kind of visualizing the input data um, is linked here. The code for performing the differential expression analysis is linked here in this notebook. And for both of these, we provided the configuration that we use for our JupyterLab instance, as well as the runtime and cost just for your reference. And then I also have a link here for uh, the publication where our input data came from. Uh, for the second example, we're going to walk through uh, a PQTL analysis. So a PQTL analysis is trying to identify the, associate, the association between variants, our variants or SNPs and how they influence changes in protein expression. And so to better understand these PQTL analysis, we can first review a GWAS analysis, where for a GWAS analysis, we have our input uh, genotype, so our uh, SNP array here, and we are trying to relate or associate this with some phenotype uh, or trait of interest, which in this case is a um, disease status. And then once we perform our GWAS analysis, this will give us the influence or contribution of different SNPs to that uh, disease or trait of interest, where the higher um, kind of um, bars here indicate uh, those SNPs that are more significantly contributing to that disease. And so similarly for a PQTL analysis, we also have um, the same type of input genotype data, but instead of disease status for our phenotype, we instead have protein expression. And then when we perform our PQTL analysis, we'll get the set of SNPs that influence um, or how much SNPs influence uh, protein expression. And so what we can then do is perform some co-localization analysis to identify those SNPs or variants that influence both disease as well as the protein expression. And so in this way, these PQTL analysis can help to identify candidate SNPs or variants um, that point to possible mechanisms of action and therefore um, might be um, of interest for follow-up functional experiments. And so um, this is conceptually how these PQTL analyses work, where we have our input genotype and our associated uh, protein expression data, and we perform our association test to generate the SNPs that influence our protein expression. However, in reality, when we're implementing this, there are actually some additional inputs that we need to provide. And so the tool that we'll be using for our association test is called Regini, where Regini has two main steps, where in the first step, we're calculating this polygenic risk score for background association correction. And the uh, inputs that we need to provide for this first step include our phenotype data, so our protein expression data, as well as our um, SNP array data, so our, gen our, sorry, our genotype data. And together, this will allow us to calculate our PRS or our polygenic risk score for each chromosome. Then in our second step, this is where we're performing our actual association test. And so to, um, to conduct this second step, we again need our phenotype data set, so our same protein expression data, but now we can use a larger genotype data set. So we can uh, use either imputed data or whole exome or whole genome data um, for this. And then we are also using our PRS scores that we generated in our first step as a covariate to then estimate the effect of each variant. So for any given variant, we are estimating the effect by correcting for the background of kind of all other SNPs essentially. And so for more information about how Regini works, uh, you can see the Regini paper that's linked here, as well as uh, I linked uh, the end-to-end -end target discovery workflow where Anastasia um, performed a really nice comprehensive step-by-step -step walkthrough of how you can perform this association test on the UKB wrap. 
And so here is our full analysis workflow for how we can how we can perform this PQTL analysis, where again, we start with our um, two types of genotype data and our associated protein expression data. We then um, can perform our set of QC steps in order to remove any technical sources of variability. And then using that post QC data, we can then input this into our Regini app to um, identify our set of significantly associated SNPs. And so again, for our input data here, we are not using UKB data. Instead, we are using public proteomic expression data for demonstration purposes. And so because we are using public proteomic data, we actually don't have a, a set of matched genotype and protein expression data. So in order to generate this match set, we actually perform um, a simulation in order to generate this. And so uh, after performing that simulation, we now have this kind of linked uh, genotype and protein expression data. And to just see how we perform the simulation, you can see the example in this Jupyter Lab notebook that's linked here. Uh, so next we can then filter samples to remove any possible confounders, as well as to remove any missing or low quality variants and proteins in our analysis. And for this uh, example use case, we'll be using the data that's gone through, um, that's been QC'd by our end-to-end uh, -end target discovery workflow webinar. And so here are the steps for how to perform the QC steps uh, linked here. And so our uh, post-QC data contains about 100,000 samples with about 500,000 variants that measure uh, 200 proteins. And so we can input this into our Regini app that's located in our tool library that's on the platform here. And uh, here are the different inputs that we provided for our example, just for your reference. So for this first step, we have our phenotype data file. And then we have our uh, smaller genotype data sets or SNP array data set. And then we also have a list of the variant IDs that we want to keep. And this is something that was outputted from our QC step. And then for our second step, we have the same phenotype uh, data files or protein expression data. And then since we have um, multiple different phenotypes, so multiple different proteins in this case, we also need to provide the sample ID file, where in this case, this is the same, um, we can use our same phenotype data set file here. And then we also provide our larger genotype data set. So in this case, we're using uh, imputed data. And for this example, we're specifically just using a single chromosome, chromosome 22, for um, demonstration purposes. And then we, again, provide our list of variant IDs to keep. And this is our resulting Manhattan plot that gets generated where um, this Manhattan plot tells us the influence or contribution of the different SNPs from our chromosome 22 to uh, protein expression, uh, specifically for this protein ADA here, where the higher value indicates uh, that the SNP is more significantly contributing. And so um, in this case, uh, so this is how we'd kind of interpret uh, the data in theory, but uh, remember, since we're using simulated data here, we actually can't make any sort of biological conclusion based off of this data. And so here's just a summary of the resources for being for that will allow you to rerun this analysis. Uh, so the code to perform the simulation of the input data to generate that matched uh, protein and genotype data can be found here in this link. The configuration for that notebook and runtime and cost are also here. The QC steps um, performed from the end-to-end -end target discovery workflow that generated our QC'd um, Genotype data can be found here. And then the steps to run uh, the Regini can be found in this readme file here. And here is the runtime and cost for your reference for running just a single chromosome 22. And then um, here is the link to the Regini publication uh, for more information there. And so in conclusion, uh, we showed how researchers can use the UKB RAP platform to analyze this new proteomics data. Uh, where this new proteomics data can be extracted via the cohort browser, either using the GUI, using the Table Exporter app, or using uh, the command line interface using that DX extract uh, dataset command. And then we also showed you two complementary uh, proteomic analysis workflows. So the first is using this differential expression analysis, 
where we uh, performed this using custom Jupyter Lab notebooks that are shared in the links. And then the second is this PQTL analysis that was run using the Regini app that's on the platform and following um, the steps from this end-to-end -end target discovery workflow. And so all in all, we hope that uh, these um, use cases provide a starting point for helping you to uh, get started analyzing the new proteomics data on the platform. So just a reminder of some of the additional uh, some of the resources um, that might help with today's webinar. So the previous integrative analysis proteomics webinar, um, the overview webinar with the basics of the platform, uh, how to work with Jupyter Lab notebooks on the platform, and this end-to-end -end target discovery workflow uh, webinar. So uh, one upcoming event that we have is this webinar on dementia and multimorbidity in late life disease. Uh, the registration page isn't available yet, um, but if you subscribe to the newsletters, uh, you will get more information there about how you can sign up uh, and register. I also wanted to uh, remind everyone of the community forum that Brenton already mentioned. So this is a really nice place for you to be able to connect with your other peers and colleagues that are using the UKB RAP. Um, it's a great opportunity for you to be able to ask any questions that you have, as well as help uh, your fellow researchers with their research. Uh, I know as I was kind of uh, starting to learn about the platform, um, I learned so much from all of the questions on all the questions and just discussions on the platform. So this is just a really uh, great resource. And finally, I'd like to thank um, the really talented uh, team, uh, UKB Rob team here at TNA Nexus. I especially want to thank uh, Chai, Andre, and Anastasia for helping to put together all of the training material for this webinar, as well as for all of the testing of the um, analysis scripts uh, for today. I also want to thank the science product team at DNA Nexus for uh, providing some of the scaffolding scripts that were used in the examples today, as well as all of their work for getting uh, the Regini app up and running. <laughs>